It's Christmas Eve, and no matter when you recognize the start of the Christmas season, for some of us it's on Thanksgiving, but for others it's earlier or later, either way, it's all been building up to this, tonight and tomorrow, basically one continuous celebration with a long winter's nap in the middle of it. And for many, if not most, that celebration this year will take a different form than usual. Maybe it'll be confined to members of the household, or maybe the form of an outdoor socially distanced gathering, or calls over Zoom, or maybe just the phone. Here in California, the restrictions at the time of this recording are pretty tight, and across the pond in London, Christmas is all but cancelled. Our London correspondent Chris has an update. Christmas 2020 is going to be very, very different. A few days before Christmas, our government decided to announce that London would be in a tier four um, capacity, which, you know, to break it down basically means we're in a lockdown in London and other parts of the UK. So I won't be able to see my family on Christmas Day. So it's going to be a very strange one. It's going to be Christmas presents opening by Zoom and a Christmas dinner in front of a laptop or an iPad or something. So I hope you had a lovely Christmas and I hope you have a fantastic new year. Chris is the host of Kringle Talks Football. Look for that wherever you get your podcasts. But no matter what your Christmas looks like this year, one of the things that won't change is the fact that Christmas Eve is the ideal day for reminiscing about Christmas past. And so, as you and I spend part of Christmas Eve together, I'm so happy to present the fourth and final Memories episode for this season. I'm so grateful to everyone who shared a memory this year, making 2020 truly the biggest and best season yet for sharing warm Christmas memories with the rest of the Christmas Past family. I've said before that sharing your Christmas memories was one of the first creative decisions that I made about this show. And as things were just getting off the ground back in 2016, it was a steep climb to get people to submit them. Even my own family and friends needed a little bit of arm twisting. But this year, more than 40 of you took the time to search your memories and open your hearts, and I just can't tell you how happy that makes me. So, let's get into the Christmas Eve spirit. Light a candle, snuggle up into your favorite blanket, take a sip of hot chocolate, or if you're like Diana in Pennsylvania, fry up some smelts and hit the dance floor. Growing up as an only child, Christmas Eve was the most magical night of the year for me and my favorite time as a family. Our Christmas Eve celebrates traditions on either side of my family. I spend the day helping my Italian-American mom prepare our seven fishes meal, only to take a break to watch Judy Garland in our favorite film, Meet Me in St. Louis. After stuffing ourselves with shrimp, smelts, squid, crab, and anchovy pasta sauce, my dad makes a fire and we dance to Celtic reels, a nod to his side of the family. I am 27 years old now and we still continue every tradition. My fiancé now joins in the dance, even if he hasn't yet developed a taste for fried smelts. Wishing everyone a very magical, healthy, and safe Christmas season. Now on Christmas Eve when I was growing up, we'd head over to my grandparents' house across town. And countless aunts and uncles and cousins would feast and laugh and sing carols. There would usually be a fire going, and it wouldn't be long before the stories of bygone Christmases would come up. My grandparents are gone now, but I'll always carry those memories with me. And I wonder how things will be different for my baby boy Dashiell, who will never meet either of his grandfathers. Well, Era in Sweden never met her grandmother, but that doesn't mean they don't share a special Christmas tradition. My name is Ada, and I'm from Sweden. And one of my absolute favorite holiday traditions was given to me by my grandma. She passed away when I was less than two years old, so I have no memories of her. But before she passed away, she made sure to make me this advent calendar so that when I was growing up, Santa came by my house every night to give me a little gift. Sometimes they were big, sometimes small, sometimes it was Clementine, sometimes a teddy bear. It really didn't matter or was about that. What I remember is just the pure excitement of waking up in the middle of the night and checking if Santa had been there and realizing that he had or, you know, waking up in the morning and just flying out of bed and checking first thing. And I have so many cute memories like this, but I think what's so special about that is that even though she wasn't there or even though I have no memories of her, she was such a big part of all of my Christmases growing up and just created so many magical Christmas memories for me. And I really do believe that that's one of the most loving things that she could leave behind for me. And now I can't wait to continue this tradition with my own kids in the future. 
sharing the excitement with them but also for her to live on and continue to spread her Christmas cheer for for many years to come. I mentioned carols before and I've previously shared some of my own memories here on Christmas Past of caroling around the neighborhood and in school. There's just something about joining the chorus on familiar songs filled with warm memories. Anne in California by way of Ontario knows just what I'm talking about. One of my favorite Christmas memories was the year my mom took us to sing Christmas carols. We drove down this blistery, snowy, windy road, lots of little side roads covered in snow. It was cold and it was blowing, but we pulled up on this tiny little church and we packed in and we were there with uh, other folks who uh, were really excited to sing Christmas carols for the evening. And even though it was absolutely freezing inside the church, we were all together packed in the pews, keeping warm with body heat. And we sang Christmas carols for the whole evening. Candles flickered. It was just such a magical memory. So that is one of my favorite Christmas memories was that cold winter's night singing Christmas carols. Merry Christmas, everyone. You know, after going to my grandparents on Christmas Eve, we'd all pile into the family station wagon, put on some Christmas music, and take the long way home. The better to see some of the festively lit houses in our town. In fact, those drives home, with the car all toasty and everyone cozied up in mittens and scarves, are almost as memorable as the party we'd just come from. Turns out I'm not the only one who thinks so. There's also Jacob in Maine. So a Christmas memory for me has to be Christmas Eve's as a kid. We'd spend it with the whole family at my great-grandmother's house. But the part that stands out to me the most isn't the evening spent with family and laughing. It was always the ride home. It would be my mother and my stepfather. We'd have Christmas music playing. And it was a long car ride home, usually. It'd be quiet. We wouldn't say much. And I would look out the window up at the sky. And I'd try so hard to look for Santa and his sleigh flying through the stars. I did that for years, even into like high school age, just to keep that feeling of Christmas and magic alive. Now that I'm 32 and I have a daughter that's about to be seven, we continue a Christmas Eve tradition by hanging out with friends that we consider to be family. We stay out late and we laugh and we have a good time and my daughter loves opening presents. And I've noticed on the ride home the last few years, it's quiet, we have music playing and she's staring out the window, and I always wonder if she's doing the same thing that I did as a child. Jacob is one of the hosts of the podcast Echo Boomers. They talk about media from pre-2010. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts, or check the show notes in this episode for a link. And I don't know if it was the same for Jacob, but on my drives, sometimes there'd be a small dusting of snow, and the Christmas lights would take on an extra magical soft glow. Or maybe the streets would be slick with rain, and they'd reflect the lights for an extra magical effect. But wintry conditions and driving around to look at Christmas lights means you need to be just a bit extra careful on the road, as Mark in Texas could tell you. Whenever uh, Bing Crosby is dreaming of a white Christmas, and people invoke... uh... The snow imagery, I think about uh, the Christmas of 2009. It doesn't snow at Christmas very often in North Texas, but one year um, we had gotten about uh, two or three inches of snow on top of the frozen slush beneath it. Uh, I had a tradition of driving around and looking at Christmas lights uh, after the family gathering was done, and I tried to do it that night, but uh, while driving around one cul-de-sac, I guess I took it a little too fast, and uh, my car lost traction. I slid off of the roadway, over the curb, and into somebody's yard, and was able to stop my car, and then actually get it out again, and back onto the street. It was a scary moment or two, and uh, I decided to hightail at home. It was a very harrowing and memorable experience, and we talk about it almost every year. Now, after we got home and avoided any traffic mishaps, we'd all get ready for bed. For a while, when I was growing up, there were four of us sharing a bedroom, two sets of bunk beds. Every night was a sort of slumber party, but on Christmas Eve, the simple act of all of us sleeping in the same room together, the thing we did every night, took on a special feeling of a shared experience and mutual anticipation. It's a feeling that's hard to describe and even harder to recapture, like Maddie in Kentucky could tell you. Every Christmas Eve, my twin sister, my brother, and I would sleep in my brother's room. 
we just wanted to be together and we were so excited for the next morning so he had a bunk bed and a trundle so we all had our own space to sleep but the older that we got the less excited we were for Christmas and we wanted to sleep in our own beds so that tradition eventually ended until Christmas of 2017 we all came home from our respective colleges and on Christmas Eve my sister and I decided that we would sleep in her room together just for old time's sake and my brother came in the room to tell us goodnight and he was so offended that <laughs> we didn't invite him to join our Christmas Eve sleepover so he being 6'4 climbed in between us and got under the covers and we all slept together that night and it was so uncomfortable and none of us got that much sleep but I'm so glad that we did that because that was our last Christmas in our childhood home. We sold the house the next year so I'm just so glad we got to have that tradition one last time in the place that we had so many fond Christmases so that's my Christmas memory. Thank you. It probably sounds cliche to say that Christmas is all about family, but this year especially, I'll bet there are a lot of us who would forego all the gifts under the tree for just a little quality time with their nears and dears. Sure, some of our favorite childhood Christmas memories are of that special gift we received, but as adults, most of the good memories are of those moments shared with the ones who matter most to us. It really is the greatest gift, as Erin in Alaska could tell you. My Christmas memory I wanted to share takes place in Yellowstone National Park. I spent four Christmases there. Um, three of them were with my friends and co-workers at Yellowstone, but the one that stands out was when my mom came to visit me which in itself was really special just to have a visitor. In the winter, there's no wheeled vehicles at Old Faithful, which is where I was working. So visitors did not usually happen in the winter, let alone for Christmas. So she came and I found out what hotel room she was gonna be in and I decorated it with Christmas lights and Christmas decorations and I hung up a stocking in her room and she was just so happy when she went in. And for her Christmas present, since I couldn't go shopping, I got her and I on Christmas Eve a day tour around the canyon of Yellowstone where you get on a snow coach and you go out into the parts of the park that most people never see in the winter and it was just a glorious day and I'll never forget the ride back to the park you know by now it's dark and we've been on the snow coach all day and I think we were all tired and I was kind of nodding off I looked up at my mom and she was wide awake with this smile on her face that just expressed gratitude and excitement and happiness in its purest form and to share that experience with her and to see her in that moment is something that I'll just treasure forever and it's a Christmas I'll never forget. Now some of us have had the experience of starting a new romance in the weeks or months leading up to Christmas. It brings up some interesting questions like, is my new sweetheart ready to meet the family? What would make an appropriate gift? Or if you're like Kevin in Colorado, would you wear outlandish pajamas in public for love? My favorite Christmas memory is from a few years ago. I had started dating a woman who lived a couple hours from me and for various reasons, she wasn't gonna be able to go home to visit her parents for Christmas. We decided that even though we'd only been dating for a couple months, we would have Christmas together with my parents who lived in the same town I did. It was the first time that my parents and her really got to spend time together, and it was great. We all had a fun, relaxed Christmas. But what's really seared into my brain is one particular moment of that holiday trip. A little before the big day, she gave me an early present, a set of really loud, fun, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer pajamas. So it's early Christmas, and it had been snowing overnight. We're up to walk our dog, and out we go to get a quick dog walk in before the morning Christmas festivities start. Now one small detail here is that, at the time, I was the mayor of the town where I lived. So out we're walking in the fresh snow, and me and my fashionable outlandish Rudolph PJs. Who should come along but one of our town snowplow drivers, one I knew quite well. He passes and gives us big honk and waves, full of Christmas cheer and obvious delight at seeing the mayor walking around the town in Pete and pajamas covered in Rudolph and abominable snow monster faces. My girlfriend's enjoyment of seeing someone see me at my comfy festive best quickly diffused any self-consciousness I might have felt, and we had a wonderful day. And the next year, I'd go on to ask this woman to marry me, and I'm pleased to say that we've enjoyed every Christmas together since. 
Every child remembers wanting to get up as early as possible on Christmas morning and rushing to the Christmas tree to see all of the things that Santa left. When I was growing up, some of my siblings and I would intentionally stay up late on the 23rd just to make sure we were all tuckered out early on the 24th. All part of a clever plan to be spry and ready at first light on Christmas morning. And I'm not the only one who's been a little overzealous about getting a jump start on the big day. There's also Jim in Canada. Years ago when I was very young, my grandmother lived with us and she loved Christmas. She was like a second mom to me. And her bedroom was right across the hallway from my bedroom. In fact, when I would lie in bed, I could see her bedroom door. Well, early one Christmas morning, um, I heard her door open. I woke up and she uh, peeked into my bedroom and she said, Jimmy, are you asleep? And I said, no, Graham. And she said, you want to go down and see what Santa Claus left? So we snuck downstairs. It was still dark and she put the tree lights on, just the tree lights. I remember this very clearly. They lit up the whole room and there was my stocking and it was jammed full of toys and goodies and I opened it up carefully in front of her and then there were also some toys that Santa left under the tree unwrapped and I played with those for a little while and then she said, well, you must be getting hungry. Would you like some breakfast? So we went into the kitchen and suddenly her face changed from this lovely smile to this look of horror. She was looking at the clock above the refrigerator and I said, Graham, what's the matter? And she said, my goodness gracious, it's two o'clock in the morning. So we quickly went into the living room, put everything back in my stocking, hung it up, shut off the tree, and we started sneaking up the stairs and she stopped and she turned and looked at me and she said, don't you ever tell your parents about this. <laughs> and you know what? It wasn't until the final maybe three or four years of my parents' life that I fessed up and told them the story. And they laughed. They thought it was the greatest little secret that my grandmother and I had between us for all those years. Jim is the same Jim whose original Christmas song Christmas Memories was featured in the last Memories episode just a few days ago. Go back and check it out if you haven't yet. It's a great one. Now, it's a good thing that Jim didn't have an accidental run-in with Santa. He was up and about in the house during prime Santa visiting hours, and children aren't supposed to see the magic in action. But there's another way to catch a glimpse of the man in the red suit, and it's all thanks to the magic of photography. Vicky in Kentucky knows what I'm talking about. One of my favorite Christmas memories was uh, with my dad, who absolutely loved Christmas and wanted everybody to enjoy Christmas as much as he did, and he took uh, great joy in surprising his grandbabies at Christmas time. And he was probably around seven when I were 70, and I remember we would go to my sister's house, and she had two little girls at the time. And my dad had this very full white beard and a Santa hat that he liked to wear at Christmas time. And we would go in the house while they weren't home, and he would uh, take a picture, or I would take the picture, rather, of him holding their dog. Uh, so you could see the back of his head and Santa hat with the dog peeking over his shoulder. And we took that picture and left it for the girls so they could see that Santa had been to their house and played with their dog. Whether you catch a glimpse of old St. Nick or not, you'll definitely see evidence of his visit under the tree. When I was growing up, one of five kids, it looked like the whole room was packed with gift wrap boxes. It was a thing of magical beauty. For some people, that spectacle is something worthy of a grand reveal, as Catherine from Texas recalls in this Christmas memory. On Christmas morning, ever since we were little, uh, we live in a two-story house and the stairs turn so you can't see the downstairs from the upper floors. And so we all sit and wait on the top of the stairs while our mom goes down and gets everything ready and she'll like turn music on and turn the tree on and stuff like that. And she usually has a camera, um, or now it's usually a phone, but she'll yell up, hey, ready, and then we, all, then we can all come downstairs and she'll film us and uh, film our reactions to our presence that we can see from the first turn of the stairs. And I, I just really like that. It was, it's this one little tradition that's stuck, and it's, it's one of my favorite. 
In my household, we never did themed Christmas trees, per se, but as we accumulated new ornaments and retired older ones, our Christmas trees took on the look of the current popular culture. Taking a look at old photos, it's not hard to guess the decade just by looking at how the tree was decorated. But for some of us, the tree has a look, which means that not all ornaments are welcome. And sometimes that means a second tree is in order, like it was for Maria in California. My husband has been a huge Star Wars fan since childhood, back when the movies first came out. He's collected quite a few Star Wars ornaments, but they've never made it onto our tree as I just can't bring myself to mix these pop culture ornaments with the vintage theme of the tree. So, two years ago, when I finally made my dream of having two Christmas trees a reality, I decided to make a dedicated Star Wars tree. I decorated discreetly, wanting to make it a surprise. It was nothing fancy, just his few existing ornaments of all the iconic Star Wars spacecraft, plus a few dozen shiny red and silver ball ornaments from a local craft store. But when the tree lights were lit, it became something magical. When I brought him in for the reveal, he was thrilled, joyfully rediscovering the tiny ships flying around the galaxy of evergreen branches. He said to me with such depth of feeling, I feel like I'm in third grade again. Taking him back to such a special part of his childhood was a wonderfully unexpected gift to have given him, and his happiness in that moment was a huge gift to me. This will always be one of my most special Christmas memories. Merry Christmas, everyone. My grandparents would always have a small, real Christmas tree. My grandmother on my dad's side had one of those aluminum ones from the 1960s with a spinning color wheel. In my childhood home, we always had an artificial tree, but as soon as I had a place of my own, I insisted on a freshly cut blue spruce. Well, for a little while anyway, eventually we reverted to artificial. Which just goes to show you that the kind of Christmas tree you grew up with stays with you, and making a switch can feel painful. On the other hand, if you're like Anne in Pennsylvania, it can feel miraculous. Ten years ago, I had one of the best Christmases of my life. The first week of December, I unexpectedly got a call for a kidney transplant that I'd been waiting for for six years. Well, we up until this point had always been live Christmas tree people. We were told due to my medical history, I should not have a live tree. So we started to look and found nothing that close to Christmas that satisfied us. Two days before Christmas, still no tree. And I had a doctor's appointment at VCU out of town. We usually grab some food at one of the amazing restaurants in Richmond. While at lunch, we asked our waiter who looked young, and he gave us the typical answer, Target, Walmart, etc. But there were a couple of ladies at the next table to us, and they said, Have you tried Strange's? We said, no, we aren't from here, and we didn't know what that was. They said, oh, it's really close by. Well, not only did we leave town a little later with the tree, we got one that was on a large floor model sale. Ten years, and the tree still looks amazing. We actually put it up tonight. My dad likes it better since it is pre-lit, and I think my mom has become okay with the fake tree, especially when we spray it with Fraser Fur Spray. Turns out the transplant wasn't our only Christmas gift as a family that year. Well, it's nearly time to bring this episode to an end. Let's close it out with a visit from Richie in Brooklyn. Like the rest of us, he's feeling the effects of all the restrictions around Christmas of 2020, but also, like the rest of us, he's doing his best to look on the bright side and count his blessings. Instead of a Christmas memory, I wanted to send you a Christmas greeting. Uh, It goes without saying that this year has been a really tough one. All the things that we usually do with family and friends will not be attainable this year and has left a lot of us feeling empty. Usually Christmas is the only time of year where my family in particular uh, can get under one roof and celebrate Christmas. And the fact that it won't happen this year uh, just leaves me feeling weird and not sure what to look forward to. Although I feel like I've gained a family member through this podcast and with you, Brian. Thank you for creating this show and the well-done episodes this year. Thank you for adding some light to our 2020, and here's to a better 2021. Merry Christmas, Brian. Congratulations. 
Well, I would like to thank Aaron, Jim, Mark, Maria, Era, Maddie, Richie, Vicky, Jacob, Diana, Kevin, Anne, another Anne, Catherine, James, and Chris for sharing their Christmas memories, and to everyone else who shared a Christmas memory this year. Hey, there's just one episode left for the season, and no surprise, it arrives tomorrow on Christmas morning. As we've done every year since the start, we'll take a look back at the Christmas news and trends from the season and generally make time for one more little podcast family Christmas gathering. I'm wishing you all the warmth and magic of the season for a wonderful Christmas Eve filled with love, warm memories, and, of course, Christmas spirit. Sleep well tonight, and let me remind you until we meet again that Christmas Past is produced in wonderful Willow Glen, California by yours truly, Brian Earl. You can drop me a line anytime, and I wish you would because I love hearing from you. You can always find me at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com or reach out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And come on by to join the private Christmas Past Facebook group if you haven't yet, and join our year-round celebration. And if you're feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people discover this show? It's as simple as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do leave a review, I'll even send you a Christmas past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card as my way of saying thanks. Reach out for details on that. Until tomorrow, stay safe and healthy, look out for one another, and may your days be merry and bright.